that, thank you so much, Andreas. It's all up to you now. Well, thank you very much. Whilst I'm getting organized, uh, there we go. So, um, awesome to be here. Um, I've got a couple of things I just want to reiterate. So, feel free to go off mute and just shout at me whenever you want to ask a question or um, think that I'm missing something or whatever the case may be. Um, I want to also set the expectation uh, correct for. Um, for the presentation I've got. So um, it is a slide deck. Um, it's uh, got a little bit of guidance in it. And yes, I will share the PDFs afterwards uh, with, the, uh, with the Benelux team so that they, they'll distribute through their normal channels if need be. Um, what um, I also want to say is um, if you feel that your expectations aren't met in terms of the content you're looking for regarding purview, then um, you know, hey, I'm happy to do ad hoc exploration. I can open up purview and we can go through some concepts. Um, so that's, the title of this is called Governing Your Lake House with Microsoft Purview. And uh, the, the, it, it is sort of level 200 to level 300 conversation around um, as a framed from a data engineer's side and a sort of a data architect side, what are the gotchas uh, that you need to think about coming from a central function, um, dealing with business users, business analysts, et cetera, right? So um, it's all about how can you get some order in your house uh, and keep the order in your house, right? So without further ado, uh, let me just move my slides along. So uh, I've divvied up or divvied up into six sections. Uh, we'll start with uh, talking a little about about current state uh, and what's happening in the data realm. Uh, we'll then um, quickly go through you know, Microsoft's point of view. Oh, sorry, forgot that full proviso. Um, my name is Andreas Bergstedt. I'm a global black belt um, uh, specialist within the Azure data and AI business. I'm employed by Microsoft. Uh, they pay my salary. Uh, and I'm a, a perpetual ev evangelist of Microsoft technology. Um, so just sort of to clear that off. Uh, the other thing also, just to explain where I sit within the organization. Uh, so the Global Black Belt organization is a pre-sales uh, architect style uh, organization. Um, we uh, sit as an escalation layer between the customers and program group in engineering. Um, and uh, we present roadmap conversations, we um, handle technical escalations, move, uh, help our customers move their uh, business uh, objectives and pro uh, programs forward. Uh, right, so all everything's on the table. You understand my job function. Uh, you understand where I come from. So um, while ACOS, I'm going to talk a little bit about history there uh, and what Microsoft's perception uh, or, or Microsoft's uh, stances on Lake House and while we love it. Uh, we also gonna uh, follow a, a conversation on data ownership and you know, data and ownership uh, to understand why from a governance perspective ownership is important. Uh, I have a seg segment called operational performance that's more around you know, what are some of the operational levers you can have to uh, to go through your data governance journey for your Lake House uh, and, and how you can interact with uh, with business. I have another section called automation and policies. So this is around what are the, some of the automation and workflow capabilities? Uh, how can you leverage policies for things like data democratization, et cetera? And then we'll end off with a, a key takeaways thing. I'll, I'll highlight five points or four points. Um, and then we can have open Q&A, open discussion, whatever you want to talk about uh, when it comes to purview. Um, and the analytics ecosystem uh, that is non, uh, not covered under NDA and publicly uh, or in the public domain, I'm happy to discuss. Cool. Um, with that, let's carry on. So, um, section called Every Scaling Problem. So, um, data, and this is just sort of thinking about what's going on in the landscape. So, Data is becoming more and more talked about. It's the the gold of uh, you know the modern gold of of business, right? Um, we um, uh, you know, we we building you know our data states are growing. Data is becoming more complex. 
Um, and from a, an architecture perspective, you know, sometimes when you building things, um, it's complex to think about how my data is going to be handled, what the architecture is going to look like, what are my ingestion processes, what was the infrastructure components to deal with, um, you know, some of these uh, pictures can become really elaborate and, and hard to understand. And, and it's just, it's sometimes tough um, to build out a, a holistic um, architecture, right? And if you're starting to think about the entire uh, you know, machine learning analytics and data platform and, and sort of technology that's out there, um, it starts getting really, really daunting and really tricky to to perhaps get a grip on on you know what you should do so um there, there's you know think about planning uh for your data architecture and and sort of managing this estate running everything it, yeah there are some tough challenges out there and that's pretty much why lake house has come around so why lake house so if we think about uh, concept, you know, where Lake House comes from, and what what the purposes of Lake House. So, if we think of a construct where um, we would look at uh, data lake uh, data lake environments, right? So, Lake House looks at uh, at sort of solving or simplifying our very complex data lakes, and we've all heard the term, you know, day lake turns into data swamp uh, and it's hard to uh, govern and manage your, your day lake because it's, you know, it's kind of a free for all. But if we think about the principles that came around data lake, it kind of makes sense because it was aimed at experimentation, yeah, quick experimentation, a um, you know, lot of um, um, agility when it came to uh, throwing compute at something, running some analytical scenario, coming up with some idea, dumping a data set into the ground, passing it on to someone else, uh, they were going to handle it, right? Um, but it it kind of, the data lakes didn't kind of work so much with the enterprise data uh, data state, and especially when you start thinking about, hey, what, what what's the answer, you know, from a, an enterprise uh, organization? I know these slides are really old, but hey, um, uh, you know, the modern data warehouse approach. Yeah, maybe maybe that wasn't the best approach. Maybe it was a compromise uh, to try to get uh, introduce sort of polyglot store and and the ability to to prep and train in Spark and and you know try to get more modern concepts uh, or data processing concepts into your cloud data warehouses. So you know, hey, uh, yeah, modern modern. The modern data warehouse approach wasn't perhaps the best. And then uh, in sort of 2020 uh, or 29, yeah, 2020, uh, when Synapse Analytics came, it was sort of the the eureka moment for for the Microsoft uh, crowd. We we uh, product group came up with or, or announced to the world we're going to have this um, unified environment called Synapse Analytics, and it's going to serve to our um, uh, our data scientists and uh, and facilitate data experimentation. It's also going to house, you know, create this common environment where with the data engineering and the sort of the, the the enterprise data warehouse crowd can can come together and we can work in one interface. And that kind of didn't work. Um, well, it did, um, but it wasn't as easy as we thought. Um, and in the meantime, we also worked together with with Databricks quite a bit to, you know, and because Databricks was getting more prevalent. So, um, you know, Databricks brought the the medallion of thinking. And uh, if we think about what the medallion architecture or the medallion principles actually bring, so we take this data lake that would have been sliced up by business topics, by environment, by zone, um, it, it, it that, that could become really, really vast. Um, Medallion architecture looked at simplifying this, and this is where the lake house concept really benefits, um, uh, sort of the, the ability to govern a modern data structure. Um, we, uh, the Medallion architecture, simplifies you know, takes them the all the different zones that you would have that would be polar, uh, polarized right 
and we bring it into three simple concepts, right? So raw is bronze, right? So we, we uh, run simple ingestion, we partition by uh, ingestion daytime patterns, uh, and that's how we how we sort of structure it, right? We we do no transformation. Everything lands in a, some form of uh, of common format. Well, sorry, in in uh, as native as possible format to its source data. So if it's structured data, we try to land it in something like Parquet uh, or CSV uh, or Orc or whatever works uh, makes sense. Um, if it's semi-structured data uh, such as JSON objects, we drop it as JSON files. Uh, or XML data, whatever may may you know, the data comes at, um, and then silver layer simplified. We we now move to uh, delta lake tables or or delta tables, um, where we uh, sort of mimic the bronze layer by topics, but we start now doing things like handling merging of data, uh, historization properly, um, making sure we. We handle duplication of data and all of that to deduplicate, but like getting you know, the, the data set now gets more and more optimized and cleansed, uh, cleansed. And then we move into a goal there that's just for final product business, you know, refined business level data, where we'd have data marts and data models, star schemas, um, single semantic models, uh, tabulated models, that sort of thing for serving. And uh, from a, an Azure perspective, how do we see this data process work? Basic lakehouse concept. So obviously have an ingestion pop where we run through pipeline, either signups pipelines or ADF pipelines. Um, you know, we uh, take our bronze data, we process in the Spark workload like signups analytics, uh, same with our silver into gold, uh, and then we serve it out using um, whatever technology you have. So if we move forward, a uh, more complete picture of this would kind of look like this, right? So, and this is life according to, to Microsoft. So uh, we'd serve our uh, data using uh, hopefully, um, uh, well, either a serverless medium uh, such as Synapse serverless, or we could use DB SQL from Databricks, um, um, or uh, perhaps uh, we run the, um, uh, the data lake sync or, or lake house sync uh, to sign up dedicated pools, but it's common sort of common practice. Now, these patterns are simple and scalable, and this is why why I'm going through it. It's Lakehouse as a concept is it, it helps you generate a, a scalable, repeatable pattern that's quite easy to maintain and and um, and control. So, on the segue of control, um, what we uh, what we quickly going to go through is a just quick conversation around data and ownership. So when, when we look at how um, more modern patterns are, are sort of creeping in, and I, I can guarantee that every single person on this call has had a, uh, at least come in contact with uh, a conversation around data mesh concepts or some form of domain driven uh, mode of operation. So, um, yeah, one thing that that sort of defines uh, these you know, data mesh patterns and domain-driven patterns is um, the responsibility of data ownership. Right. So, generally, it's federated data ownership. So, um, you know, central IT will provide uh, either guidance uh, or raw, uh, raw infrastructure or, or pat, um, uh, uh, just architectural sort of patterns that, that can be reused or, or some form of consumption layer that, uh, that each domain would have to work with. But the, the, the concept is to, to determine ownership by the domains, right? And, and this is somewhere where purview has become really good at, at, at sort of starting to harness the, the ability to simplify the ownership or, or getting to grips with this because it, it can get very complex. Um, so Purview has a concept called um, uh, called collections, right? And collections gives you this ability, sorry, before I move on, 
with collections. Um, are there any questions at this point in time? Bear in mind, I cannot see the chat. So, Danny, if no. I am no uh, I'm watching the chat for you, Andreas. I'll ask okay. questions as they come in, but not right now. No questions. Okay, perfect. Um, and just generally, anyone have any questions? No? Awesome. Cool. Let's move on then. So, collections gives you the ability to sort of structure things. And um, if you look at this, um, this example on the screen, so um, this is specific for uh, sort of domain style uh, architecture, right? So we can see our domains. So we have engineering, manufacturing, logistics, et cetera, right? Um, and then underneath there, we got uh, the sort of the process zone. So gold, silver, and, and, and bronze, right? So it gives us a way of handling, um, uh, you know, structuring uh, our lake house, you know, and representing it from a, a data ownership perspective quite easily. Um, now, what's the benefit of doing it this way? Well, we automatically ex uh, sort of have the ability to establish a control and data access uh, from a purview perspective, because the collections provide control plane and data plane access. Um, and it, it, yeah, so for instance, you, you don't expect any analysts or, uh, or business, business analysts or business sort of data citizens uh, to have access to your bronze layer because who cares about raw data from that set? It's just a, uh, you know, it's just system data coming in, right? Um, and you don't necessarily expect them to, to have access to the silver layer either. Predominantly, you only expect them to have access to, to the gold layer. So the reason that is important to think about is because it helps out the searchability and discoverability. So as a business user, I open a purview and I search. Uh, I don't want to see all you know, my 200,000 uh, entities in my uh, in my lake house, right? Or in my in my various lake houses for my entire organization. I only want to. I only care about seeing what's pertinent to me from consumption perspective, right? So that's the one thing that collections give you. Um, the other thing that gives you, as I said earlier, is that it, you know, you're able to quickly ascertain and and, um, uh, and determine ownership. So, um, if you know, if you've got a, if you're viewing an entity as a business user, uh, you can quickly see the hierarchy of the collection hierarchy where it sits. So you can say, hey, this is engineering department, so I or the engineering domains. So I know this is engineering data. This is manufacturing or marketing or logistics or whatever. So I can understand very, very quickly and filter uh, quite intuitively um, in, you know, into what data I want to see and you can refine easy. So that structuring this helps you determine that data ownership. Um, it also helps you to establish common processes or process patterns. So uh, for instance, if we think of it from a a scanning perspective. So let's say we run the scope scan for uh, the bronze zone, right? So we know that we have, uh, from a data engineering perspective or data integration perspective, we have a common way of landing uh, bronze data. So um, setting up a concept like advanced resource sets with specific pattern rules for what my what the folder structure is in my bronze zones. Um, if you have common structures, you can create one pattern, one common pattern rule for, let's say, um, uh, API data from a certain uh, REST endpoint, right? So JSON data is going to land. Um, and that follows as a certain way of, of coming into folder stru structures. I'll get my API endpoint uh, alias that's common. Um, I can put that into my file name uh, or into my data set name. Uh, I have whatever naming convention structure that I want to bring through, and I can use these pattern rules uh, through the advanced resource sets uh, to make sure that I optimize the way that my data is searchable and discoverable. Uh, and one typical example where um, where this is learnings uh, is um, I had a, uh, more than one customer make this mistake um, or, or or not reading the manual around the advanced resource sets. Um, and one particular customer had a, um, a, a REST endpoint that would harvest data every hour or so from, 
and they've been doing this for years and years and years into the day lake. And because they were using some unorthodox naming standards, the built-in scanning heuristics of, uh, of Purview didn't quite understand um, how these JSON files had been uh, been structured and, and what to, how to bundle them together as a resource set. Um, and it caused them, instead of having 10 entities, because it was really 10 API sources, uh, so 10 entities that should be discoverable and searchable, uh, they got four, over 400,000 entities uh, in, uh, in the catalog. And that besides that, that would blow up the consumption through Purview, it would also uh, cause problems because it, you literally polluted the, uh, the catalog. Luckily enough, it was quite simple to rectify. You create, there was um, one pattern rule through an advanced resource set that needed to be created, and it collapsed all of these into the 10 entities, and it was, you know, it was really easy to use in the end. Um, so obviously, there are, you know, if you have common patterns in how you load data in zones, um, it just kind of makes sense, right? Um, the other thing uh, that um, collections help you with is to scope things like policies and workflows, right? So if you have a data access policy, uh, you scope that to uh, a collection hier hierarchy and then a certain type of assets underneath there, uh, as well as things like um, your uh, data curation workflows. They're also scoped. Uh, so if, if I have a, uh, a stewardship or a data steward or data curation policy on an asset, um, I can scope it. So for instance, I might not want to create a, an update approval process for data that's scoped to my bronze zone because quite frankly, that's raw engineering data. And um, I, don't, I don't need that as curated as I might need uh, uh, silver zone or gold zone data, right? So I might have uh, be more relaxed and, and sort of ignore the um, uh, curation workflows or, or approval workflows for curation of entities uh, inside of the bronze zone and just apply them to my gold zone, for instance, right? And I might have some for my silver zone, but it, it just, uh, it helps you to, to scope how you, you manage policies and workflows. Right. And then obviously um, it you know, enables the ability, all of this together enables the ability to then provide uh, your know, self-service data democratization um, and assists in data literacy, right? So uh, because you have a, an easy structure, you got the right policies at the right step, um, it's, data becomes easily discoverable um, and uh, the business users and uh, can just search the catalog, go find a, a data product or data assets that they want access to, uh, hit request access, um, and the correct workflow goes. Um, we'll, I'll show a little bit later on, uh, I've got a slide on, on what workflows look like and we can talk a little bit around them. Uh, any questions on collections? Is there anything? I haven't seen any questions in the chat yet. So if people cool. want to come off mute, now is the chance. Let's move on. Yep. Right, so the next portion uh, or the next section is called operational performance. And this is all around, you know, operating, um, you know, what can you do to operate your uh, your governance platform uh, for your lake house, right? So um, what I wanna sort of frame this, the start of this is uh, just understanding how Data governance is defined by the business. That's always important to understand, you know, uh, chief data officer, lead architects, understand executive sponsorship, you know, because obviously data governance is not something that actually IT buys into. Uh, IT knows it has to happen because IT knows that it has certain requirements, right? But IT doesn't necessarily own the data governance process uh, from, a, from a business buying perspective but they, they're obviously part of it, right? So, and since we've already established that um, IT also doesn't necessarily own the data or has the data ownership uh, responsibilities that should 
lie with business, so within a, a, an organizational unit or a, a domain, or a data domain or a business domain, uh, you know, it's important to understand these flows because they don't, you know, if we understand them, we can then understand and, and sort of articulate. So if we're coming from an IT and centralized perspective, how to um, encourage our business users, users and your, our business communities to buy into, um, you know, good stewardship and uh, you know, best practice when it comes to documenting um, their own data. And her view gives you the ability to not only document uh, or practice good stewardship through um, you know, maintaining data artifacts in your gold zone, such as reports, um, uh, data sets, you know, schemas, whatever it may be, and business glossaries, but also gives you the ability to provide a bridge between um, uh, sort of business processes uh, and, and and sort of how to define things like data products. So if you, uh, for instance, if you um, have a set of analysts building data products for marketing, for instance, um, you could encourage them from an operational sense to, um, to make the data governance steps part of the definition of done. Um, so for instance, um, if we have a, a meta model on data products, right, and um, there are certain things that need to be defined, uh, if you stand up a, a data product, uh, you need to uh, go and document that data product within purview uh, as a business artifact uh, or as a business asset, uh, and then tie in the required relationship. So which data domain is the owner, what what are the linked data sets for this product, um, who's the SME, um, and that sort of thing. Because that gives you that complete sort of impact analysis. So you can step from a, an actual business process down to linked data sets, down to understanding um, the, uh, you know, the downstream dependencies. Right? We've got some questions, Andreas. Oh, go chat. for it. Yeah. Go for it. Um, Eduardo wants to know, is there any approach to anonymize or to pseudo anonymize the data? And the second part of that question is, where do you define the roles for product ownership? I think it's two questions along. Yeah, they're, the they're, they're, yeah. Two, they're two separate questions. So the one yeah. was on data anonymization. Yeah. Right? Um, so where do you define that? Um, as it stands today, um, um, I, I can't talk about as it stands in the future, but not mm -hmm. on this call, yep. um, due to NDA constraints. Uh, but as it stands today, um, that would be uh, in your. Um, you 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 know you you could leverage um, uh, the, whatever reporting is available currently in in terms of handling PI assets and sensitive assets, right? As a as a mean of of then applying a written policy to then you know translate that either through data integration. So you could say all uh, you know all data that's being handled for this asset. Uh, you can have some data anonymization process and would then fire off an engineering process onto the endpoints and then you know apply data masking or dynamic data masking, for instance, if it's a SQL asset or uh, you know run some form of uh, obfuscation algorithm um, uh, against the data set and reprocess that. That's how we handle it today. Uh, we do have some uh, partners, so if it's specific. Uh, if you think of it from a, a MOS data perspective, uh, we do have some of our partners, such as Prophecy, include in in Semarchi that are currently able to handle this, um, handle uh, you know, domain specific data um, mm -hmm. uh, with in, in terms of anonymization. So you could apply those kind of uh, transformative uh, data quality or data data curation rules uh, at a row level through those processes. Um, what was the second question? Where do you define the roles for product ownership? Right. So product ownership. Uh, so if we're using the the meta model constructs, um, 
you would then um, uh, you you could define we define the roles for product ownership. Um, so you can have a um, you have a, um, a, a an owner on um, on a business um, artifact. So if you have a data product defined part of your meta models, you can have an owner of that, and that would then be your. You can translate that to the uh, uh, the data product owner. Um, alternatively, um, you could um, make that inherited um, in your, uh, you know, if you think it in broad terms. So if the if the domain that you know that has been represented or the business unit is the owner, uh, so not an individual but a group or at least a business unit level, uh, you could uh, define that by just um, uh, your sort of collection hierarchy as well. Okay. Then Anything we else? One more question and then we can move on. Cool. Smile wants to know, do collections represent data domains? You can. Uh, so they're versatile. So if, if you, our recommendation is always to go with your operational patterns that suits you the best because Collections represent or, or enables you to scope um, uh, things like access control, how data gets becomes visible, and those kind of things. Like how you so in in, in essence how the what access rights and and uh, you have to data artifacts within the the, the uh, data map and the catalog. So um, I would always. The guidance is that the more if we step back, let's just step back to this this guy here, right? So uh, if we look at this slide, you know, we we always, you know, since collections contain data sets, right, or data sources, uh, collections you can scope scans and data sets within those data sources to collection level, and since domains should contain ownership, right, of data or represent ownership, then a domain collection would then represent uh, a domain. And this is our, always our, been our guidance. It, it helps you structure data if you do it this way. It, it just makes life a lot easier when you start looking at all the other automation capability and sort of uh, aspects of purview. Yeah, makes cool. sense. All right, thank you. Let's Let's keep going. Awesome. Um, so um, the other part of uh, trying to be um, of operational efficiency um, is around taking part in the native capabilities to enable visibility, right? So use the built-in scanning capability um, as much as possible. Um, you know, part of this, you know, part of your, uh, you know, if, if you're looking at how you can make these, uh, you know, the, the scanning engine and perhaps even the REST APIs uh, to build relationships for custom processes, uh, part of your daily, um, uh, your daily engineering process and your daily mode of operation, that just becomes, you know, that, that that's a sort of penultimate part of, of, uh, of providing visibility because, uh, you know, if, if using, uh, the solutions accelerator for Databricks um, uh, so to catalog to you know uh, extract lineage for your Databricks jobs, uh, or whether you're using the uh, ADF or Synapse Analytics pipelines integration or the SQL lineage process. Just try to use these natively because it gives you really good out of the box capability that that just uh, I mean in this example on the screen is like I've got one sort of, I want to do an impact analysis, right? So uh, I have, excuse me, uh, I have one uh, sort of column lineage uh, artifact I'm looking for. So I want to know where's email impacted. So I can see the processes that it steps form to and where it's going. Uh, so I can see all the ADF jobs or, or data factory jobs. Uh, I can see the, the, uh, the uh, uh, data factor activities, and I can see where the source is coming from, right? So 
uh, always, you know, these tools gives you better visibility, and especially when you when you're tying it together with a business, uh, sorry, with a meta models. Understand, you know, being able to say, hey, I'm going to change one business process, and I can get the entire downstream impact to understand, hey, this is going to actually affect these entities, and I can then go and see, well, you know, these processes belongs to these different data owners, and uh, you know. And I then understand, you know, I need to notify these guys. I need to handle these data contracts, but potentially, right? Um, I need to make sure that everyone, all that my data sharing agreements are in place or, or being updated. Um, I negotiate in new OLAs, perhaps with a different business unit that's consuming my data. Uh, but it it just gives you that auditability. Um, also, like meta models combined with the data lineage gives you such great power in terms of understand um, doing gap analysis. So if you have a, a business analyst that's been tasked to do something, you know, combine the meta models and the business artifacts together with a with actual lineage, it's you know, it, there are some really phenomenal capabilities that service business there. Yeah. We've got some questions, Andreas. All right, cool. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Marike wants to know is every transformation visible in the lineage? Are there any requirements for data assets to show lineage? Um, I'm going to try to decompose that question a little bit. Yep. So I, I think there's two, two parts to that. So the one is around what data transformation support lineage currently in purview. Mm -hmm. uh, so at, at, and that's as it stands today, there's um, from a native Azure perspective, um, store procedures, um, data factory, copy power plants and data flows, as well as Synapse data, data copy activities and data flows. There are some limitations and restrictions around parameterized and dynamic objects or, or dynamic power plants um, that, that will cause a bit of complication. We're trying to solve for that. Mm -hmm. um, the Power BI lineage is starting to mature. Um, there will be some announcements about that uh, publicly quite well in, in a short while. Um, but there, there's currently being a, there's a, a big internal drive to get lineage supported by more and more products. Uh, there's a lot of on-prem assets that currently uh, support lineage from store procedures and views, such as, you know, if you've got Teradata data appliances, um, Oracle databases, um, um, SQL Server, uh, SOAP procedures. Um, SQL Server views, I don't think, generate lineage at the moment, but that will shortly. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, but the, 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 there will be some, some announcements and some improvements over the next couple of months, around, especially around lineage um, and their capability. In terms of um, uh, being able to view the lineage, so you obviously need to um, see the artifacts or have access to the artifacts uh, in uh, in terms of you need to have um, catalog read access as a minimum uh, at collection level where these uh, entities are stored. Um, so there's obviously that. Um, so you won't be able to see if you don't have access to uh, the bronze layer, for instance, you won't see lineage on a, on a gold level asset. Um, or you won't see the end-to-end -end lineage there. You'll see it from the gold level asset, which is the published data product, so to speak, and then maybe forward towards your your uh, reporting levels so through your uh, Power BI reports, etc. Yeah. Then, next question. Kurt wants to know to what extent can the lineage or the lineage model that we're seeing right now be? To what extent can it be reverse engineered or automatically discovered? To not have to manually manually document a few of these things. So um, I'm gonna give the, um, the the example of a very large financial institution in Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, they're multinational, but uh, this was done within the MIA time zone, uh, where they would they were documenting their API lineage. So here you have an API consumed by another uh, 
by another process, uh, consumed by another one, consumed by another one. So what they did was they built in, um, as part of the release process, they would use the purview, the Atlas APIs. So we have a fully, yep. they, you know, we use the Atlas APIs, right? They, they through their Git actions, when they committed something and when it got elevated into prod, part of that was to publish its existence and its relationships between data artifacts. And it would create data artifacts in the catalog if they didn't exist, right? According to purviews, naming conventions. The so purviews have very specific standards when it comes to how an, uh, an asset is, is discovered, searched for, and identified, right? So they, they just follow that pattern and they would you know, programmatically just build this out and, and, and they would publish thousands of, of APIs this way uh, with complete lineage to uh, source systems, so databases, um, you know, storage accounts, wherever they may be. So they, this can be uh, hyper extensible in terms of, of how you can bake it in. Yeah, uh, we, we do have some accelerators, by the way. So the uh, the Databricks Lineage Solutions Accelerator, uh, that concept uh, is pre cooked for Databricks. However, you can use that open lineage capability and use the same uh, same source code and just you know for whatever process you want to run. Uh, so you, you can take the same same gated process and just adopt adopt it to whatever programmatic process you want. Yeah. One more question on on the 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 lineage and the metadata part before we move on. There's another question from Ismail on generic best practices, but I'll park that until the end of the session. Okay. The question cool. right now is: Is there any news, for instance, on when we're going to be able to scan? For lineage dataverse and the common data model for example to ingest the data model for dynamics 365 um, which is a very very i, ca I can't talk ask. about that yeah that's what i figured okay so yeah. so i i can neither confirm nor deny yes. uh, right so, so let, let, let's yeah. make that dream of that as you may uh but you can't quote me on anything yeah okay right is that it yep that's it let's keep going cool Cool, let's move on. Um, right, the next section uh, is around automation and policies. So this whole subsection of the deck is, uh, I just want to highlight some, some of the things that you can do to, um, uh, you know, accelerate uh, data democratization, you know, how you can streamline processes and what you can actually do in the back end. Because a, a lot of, I'll bring up a workflow example, right? So picture a self-service data access workflow. So currently out of the box today, we support um, just with a few different uh, data sources, um, the ability to um, set up uh, sort of self-service data access policies, right? So we support um, Azure SQL DB, and uh, ADLS Gen 2 um, data sets from a, a, yeah, the ability to request access. So if you browse in the catalog, you see a Parquet partition or a CSV file or a or something, right, data set, and you click the request access button, um, a workflow will fire off, right, um, and that will look at, is this an, an asset that's got self-service so it's got the does it have uh, you know is it compliant with the uh the um data use governance policies right um well well first of all ask the the data owner right so sorry it, when the when the process kicked off let's take it from the beginning so uh it creates a, a data access request right um you can parameterize it uh, to the, the data owner, right? So it's associated with the data owner. Uh, and then it says, is it, you know, is it approved or not? Um, if it is, if it's not approved, then a dear John is sent back an email by default uh, to the requester. If not, then see, can I uh, manage this through 
data use governance policies, right? So in other words, do we have endpoint access from a purview perspective to grant the user access rights? Uh, if yes, then by default, hey, grant access to the requester to that data asset. If no, then the default says, hey, create a task, assign it to the data owner or this data steward or this group of, uh, of users. Um, um, and they must resolve it manually and it sends an email, uh, you know, that, hey, um, you know, once it's completed, you'll get a notification that you now have access, right? But you don't have to, just because the data source isn't supported, you can build um, a, a generic engineered uh, pipeline. So let's say uh, you want to get some of this plumbing done automatically, you could point, um, you know, programmatically point to a, um, a REST endpoint. So the, in this case, the Azure management plane uh, and run a, a, a data factory job uh, or data factory pipeline passing in uh, the FQDN of the data asset and the, and the requesting user in this case, right? And that would automatically run the, you know, so let's say this is a, 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 a SQL asset in the back end. It would then run a, a grant statement for whatever table it is, right, to the specific user. Make sure, you know, however you would engineer this pipeline. Uh, or it could be a storage account. So to, it would, uh, you know, add an ACL or it would add you onto a group of data readers for that, uh, for that specific well, if this was storage account, it would be go straight to the um, uh, to the grant access, but let's say it wasn't, right? Um, or if you have an on-premises data asset that we've scanned, so an on-prem SQL server or um, Oracle server or whatever it may be, it's not part of data use governance, but you can have an engineering job that fires a generic procedure that would then grant access. So you have the ability to extend these workflows and don't, yeah, just because it's today it's not available for self-service data governance out of the box doesn't mean that you can't automate the stuff, right? Um, and another example is around, uh, you know, using things like the uh, the glossy term updates. So um, you you can customize these. You you've got these approval gates, right? And here's an example about um, when you update uh, um, uh, an entity in a, uh, well, this is for a glossary term, right? So uh, this one goes and says, hey, do I have a, a, an expert assigned to this? Because glossary term approval should be done by a glossary expert, right? So um, if I have a, cohort of, if I don't have an expert assigned to this glossary, then automatically apply the uh, the term and then the rest of the job will fail. But it's, it's just there's an underlying workflow engine that you can extend and that's what I'm trying to get at. So it's it's important to, to see these, um, uh, you know, see all of this periphery around purview and its workflows and policies and, and sort of see how you can uh, use them to automate your plumbing and your workload. Cool. Before I jump into my final segment, any other questions? No, nope, no questions. Cool, great. So key takeaways, so they're quite simple. So as the data landscape is expanding, um, and so as the business needs, you know, things becomes more complex and it's in the, con in the context of this session, we need to stay on top of um, uh, of the data governance aspect because it's not getting data governance is not getting smaller as a concept or as a as a topic and and it's becoming more and more important for uh, for business to govern data. So that's the first takeaway. Second one, look for standard patterns to help IT. Um, uh, but you know we must also remember that uh, that only works or, or IT can only be helped out. Uh, if uh, we understand that get data governance is a team sport, right? And so only, data governance only works as a team sport. Not only IT, but business needs to buy into it. And then, you know, 
build data governance controls into the engineering practices, such as you know, embed them in your in your uh, Git actions or uh, part of your your standard practices uh, to ensure that good governance become part of your business rhythm. Um, because then, you know, um, without that, it's just going to run away from you. And then final thing is like leverage automation and remove dependencies of central teams, because uh, you know whilst well, central teams, such as central IT, is often responsible for standing up infrastructure. Central IT doesn't want to manage data uh, or business processes. They they just you know here's a tool, here's a framework. You know, create uh, you know, leverage the automation automation aspect so you don't have to bother about approving you know data access or anything like that. That should be farmed out uh, to the owners as safely as possible. Cool. And with that. My session or well, my slide deck is over. So uh, let's you know, uh, open mic. To, on, I'll go off mute, ask questions. Let's see. Yeah. We've got one question that I parked. Okay. Because I thought that it was going to derail uh, the conversation a bit. But Ismail asked the question What are some of the best practices and recommendations for defining and implementing a data product in Microsoft Purview? Um, so best practices. So there is a. I'm going to stop sharing my screen quickly. Yep. Uh, if I can just get to stop presenting. Uh, and I want to. Open up another deck. So there is a great deck by one of my colleagues that talk around. Uh, data mesh implementations and especially around data products because central to data products is central to data mesh, right? Yeah, uh, let's see what that thing is. Sorry, I've got too many slide decks that have opened recently. Um, so I just hence why I had to stop sharing because I didn't want to open the wrong one. Yeah, uh, this is an old deck that should be shown ever again. Um, one second for me. Yeah, this is the right deck. So I'll put that on the screen and let me share my screen. Uh, and I'll share this. Um, I'll get the link to the to this deck um, and and share the link to the the public version. It's published already. Yeah. Let me just get to the sharing side. Right. So this deck uh, by uh, and I I butcher this guy's name, so I'm not even gonna. Uh, he's a Dutch colleague of mine. He did he this one. Old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I'm so sorry. I'm Swedish, as so I struggle with these yeah. things. Um, uh, so he did he, the original version of this deck was between him and James Sarah, uh, and that came from uh, they did this one uh, way back when in 2001. Uh, sorry, 2021. Uh, you know, around what what's Microsoft's approach to data mesh, right? And in this slide, he's got one. If I can just find it, there we go. The talks are on data products. So um, you'll obviously here you have, uh, you know, in terms of purviews definition or, or how how we can see, you know, the meta model serving data products, right? And and sort of talks about that. There's links to uh, additional, um, uh, you know, how the meta models are worked, um, but also all of this references the cloud scale analytics uh, framework. So we have uh, in the Microsoft Learn session. So if you let me open up my browser, I'm going to grab that URL and I'm going to paste that one in the chat. Um, 
the you know cloud adoption framework. So uh, we've updated our cloud adop cloud adoption framework, um, and we have a whole section around data products, uh, data mesh specific guidance. Uh, if my there we go. Uh, da, da, da. There you go. So data mesh and uh, data products. So uh, we th there's a whole guidance around uh, how we see data products, and, and we have examples uh, around that. Um, the whole uh, cloud scale analytics um, framework has got uh, a whole bunch of pre-baked things around um, marketplace, yeah. uh, you know, control tower style uh, operations, and how to manage the entire um, uh, call it mesh operations or, or domain-based operations. So we we got uh, yeah, all of these are uh, are well documented. I'll, what I'll do, I'll just grab this guy and paste him in the chat. If I can get to the chat window. Sorry, my laptop's acting up a little bit. There we go, it's in the chat. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, did we have anything? Oh, there we go. So I see there's some other questions as well. Yeah. Right, where were we? Uh, so the only open question I have right now is a question from Sri Rama, but I am fairly confident that I know the answer. What's the roadmap for embedding a data quality framework into Purview? As of today, do we have a way to document business rules or data quality rules within Purview? Document them, yes. Integrated, I can't talk about. <laughs> and I'm sorry, it's so hard. Uh, it, 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 yeah. it, it, it's NDA related, so I can mm -hmm. neither confirm nor deny that anything lies in the in the in the yeah. backlog. Um, uh, documenting um, data quality rules, so um, parts of that I can talk about. So obviously we have a business glossary where you could define data quality rules at the business gloss. I'm sorry, I haven't gone through any of the interface, right? But uh, the glossary is a hierarchical structure, so you could have, uh, you could obviously pin that and document that in, in your business glossary. Um, I see Ishmael's got another one. Is it practical to sign a person's name as an expert owner? Work with user groups with mail and label features. Uh, it depends. If you're obviously, if you sometimes it's impossible to to um, name a group or cohort of people. Um, so, so it depends. If you um, it can be practical to assign a single individual, just understand what the implications are around that. So um, it's always better to ha have a, if this is a, a an owner by domain, to have a, a data, you know, data domain and then data owners group or, or data owners workers or whatever that distribution group would be, and then assign people to it. Think about people come and go, right? So from an administrative point of view, if it can be a male enabled uh, group, then it's obviously easier to handle it that way. Um, uh, but sometimes you have to name people, right? Sometimes, uh, but it, it, it's all a decision. It's a trade up, you know, if you yeah. have a, you, you can always name people as well. So if there's specific, um, if it's like you build it, you own it kind of scenario, uh, you could always do that as a as an exit again as definition of done. You put your name down as data owner, uh, even though um, uh, you know uh, the data owner. You might also have a, a group there as well. So it all it all depends. My advice is to whatever pattern or whatever uh, process you decide is the best, stick to that one process. Right, and make it part of operations. It's, it's the only way it works, or else, um, yeah, or else it gets hard. Cool. Anything else? I don't see there's any other questions. I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat window. Um, maybe one last chance if someone wants to come off mute, ask the question themselves. Feel free to feel free to do so. Nope, 
Nothing? Um, no. Cool. Oh, wait, there we go. <laughs> Where's the ETA to have? <laughs> hey, that's a data quality question. I cannot answer that. Yeah. <laughs> it, my, it, my strido. Yeah, it, my it, strido. yeah uh, I, um, I have to become Mr. Teflon and, and shrug these okay. ones off. There, there's, yeah. uh, I, I can't talk about it. Yeah. Okay, well, um, if there are no more questions, then thank you so much for your time, Andreas. My pleasure. Anything, yeah, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, I, I will, um, Benny, I'll send uh, uh, I'll send you uh, a copy of the yep. uh, the deck, and then you can distribute that through your normal yep. channels. Yeah, absolutely, perfect. Cool. So I, I see I Peter might you, want to have a question. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Loud and clear. Perfect. Uh, yeah, we are in uh, let's say a process to uh, select um, and the master data management platform uh, based on Microsoft purview. And Prophecy is also a component which is uh, advised uh, to complement to what Purview is offering. Um, can you tell anything about the, the, the roadmap or the strategy from Microsoft to um, support third party components like uh, Prophecy on the long term? Is that uh, yeah. still a so, good decision? Yeah, so I can, I can. Um both Prophecy and Cluden are our GA ISV partners for master data management. And um, we have, uh, we support our modern lifecycle management policy. So uh, they're named, they're first party uh, from an integration perspective. Uh, they're fully supported. There is no plans on severing that relationship uh, anytime soon. Uh, so as far as we're concerned, they're a marketplace vendor. We have a, a very good relationship uh, and we have, we don't have any plans and the, I guess this is important to to frame when it comes to purview and master data management. When we when we came up with purview, when we, when we went down the purview product route, we took a decision around master data management that that was always going to be or or for the foreseeable and almost perpetual future was always going to be excluded uh, from uh, purview, the purview platform. And the reason for that is if we run the master data management route, we then become data processors, which means we're liable for your uh, regulatory compliance as well. And we're liable to pay fines if you breach. So we don't want to have your actual data and process that. We, we just want to interrogate it from a, a classification perspective and cataloging perspective. We only want to deal with metadata. right? So. Uh, as, as far as is it long term supported? Yes. Uh, it, you know, which one should you go for? You decide. Clued in and prophecy. If, if you already, uh, whichever one fits you the best, um, but both of those are, are GA. All right. Thanks. It's a very clear answer. Thanks for it. Cool. <laughs> Great. Right. Uh, awesome. Uh, uh, wait, there we go. <laughs> Do you think DataRicks alone is enough to work with BI, data science, and data engineering teams? Um, um, I'm going to say this. Uh, Azure DataBricks is a first-party service in Azure, um, I, and I fully support it. Um, if you have, um, uh, you know, you, if you have a data engineering requirement or a, uh, or a, a data science requirement and your teams work within, with Azure Databricks, power to you and I'll support you all the way. Uh, that, that's how I want to see it. I mean, they are the, the data engineering, specifically the, the Spark community is very, very pro Databricks. You know, if you, if you think of the, the wider Spark community and data engineering community, Databricks has got some awesome, fantastic tools out there to to support data engineering practices. Um, they they have been the thought leader for a long time uh, within the Spark community, and I mean, hey, they they come from the Apache Spark project, right? So uh, they are they are you know all in. We we support them. Uh, we I know you know a lot of people say, well, you have some product overlap, but that's okay. We all have our strengths and weaknesses, um, and that we uh, we uh, we love each other. We we play happy together. So 
um, Databricks is, if that is, um, is great for you, then awesome. Um, in the in the context of governance um, and uh, you know looking at uh, purview versus uh, so for context today so purview versus um, unity catalog uh, we're not competing products we're completely different scope um, unity is about uh, databricks state uh, inventory and policy management uh, whereas purview is about holistic uh, you know, data governance and, and that sort of thing. So hopefully that was not too vague and, and was at least, you know, uh, quite good. So, sorry, so uh, now I'm, I'm mute. Uh, maybe uh, another question to this. Um, it's okay? Sure. Um, if I, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, because I, I'm using Databricks and uh, now we are uh, to decide uh, how can we integrate our BI team in our um, landscape. Um, and uh, there is a question, is a Databricks enough um, for BI um, requirements? Um, because you know SQL Warehouse is uh, now uh, active or you can use it in the Databricks, but uh, I'm not sure if uh, the BI um, yeah, um, requirements are um, yeah, can can uh, solve or can, we can do that on on Databricks. So, so um, yeah. So, so I want to say this is: should you use DB SQL and serverless endpoints? Is what I'm hearing for for BI. Is that that that's kind of what I'm hearing? Is that what you what you asking? No, we are to to discussing about uh, should we use Azure Synapse or uh, should we only use uh, Azure Databricks? And with this, I want to say that it's entire that's entirely up to you. Um, okay. I I I I cannot. I mean, I'm an Azure guy, right? Uh, <laughs> Azure yeah. Databricks is an Azure product, and Azure Synapse Analytics uh, is a uh, is an um, uh, Azure product, and um, I support both, um, and I cannot be uh, be partial in this, right? Um, I, I mean, I come from a SQL Server background. I worked in the Microsoft BI stack for decades before I joined Microsoft. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, uh, hey, uh, I'm I'm a traditionalist sort of evangelist when it comes to, to Microsoft, but it, it's it's up to you. Uh, if your if your dev teams work with Databricks and they they um, you know they enjoy it then great. Um, both platforms are going through innovation uh, at the moment, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know we're not deprecating anything. So uh, whichever whichever platform you choose is going to be a safe bet long term regardless. Thank you very much. Cool. Awesome. Uh, any other non roadmap questions, please? Uh, I think that's it for questions. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Andreas. Then oh, thanks. Uh, we'll catch up for, for anything for links, etc. And then have a lovely evening, everyone else. Cool. Awesome. Cheers, all.